Hi everyone, this is Miss Lassar, and I'm excited to tell you about our next lecture topic, which is ecology. So we're gonna start by talking about the physical setup of the earth. We're gonna look at food webs and the relationships between organisms, and then I'll finish by talking about the biomes that you see on earth. So starting with the physical setup of earth. Earth's four spheres that contribute to their life support system. So the first sphere is the atmosphere. And this is a thin spherical envelope of gases surrounding the Earth's surface. This includes nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, the gases that are necessary for life on Earth. The hydrosphere consists of all of the water on or near the Earth's surface. So we've got liquid water on the surface, groundwater underground, we've got frozen water as ice in polar ice, icebergs, glaciers, ice in frozen soil layers called permafrost, and also water vapor that's up in the atmosphere, all the water that's on Earth. The geosphere consists of the Earth's intensely hot core, uh, a thick mantle composed mostly of molten rock, and then a thin, cooled, crispy, solid outer crust. And that's where we live, on that crust. Uh, most of the geosphere is located in the Earth's interior, but its upper portion, the solid crust that we walk around on, contains non-renewable fossil fuels and minerals that we use, um, as well as renewable soil chemicals, nutrients that organisms need in order to live, grow, and reproduce. And then finally, there's the biosphere. And this consists of the parts of the atmosphere, geosphere, and hydrosphere where life is found. So all of the parts of the hydrosphere, geosphere, and atmosphere where living things are found, that is the biosphere, which is definitely the smallest component of Earth's life support system. This is a reminder that life depends on three things, and you thought about these before as principles of sustainability. The first thing that we depend on is high quality energy flowing in from the sun. That solar energy is trapped by leaves on plants during photosynthesis, and that provides the energy that gets put into chemical energy that fuels all of life's processes. And that energy and chemical energy is constantly being transferred from one form to another, from one organism to another, and we know that it degrades over time. Thank you, second law of thermodynamics. And so it's critical that we're always getting a new input of that high quality solar energy to balance out all of the energy that we're losing in less useful forms like kinetic or sound energy or just as heat that's radiating out to the environment. Another thing life depends on is chemical cycling, because we have a fixed amount of things on Earth. We've got a fixed amount of matter and carbon atoms and nitrogen atoms on Earth. And so that matter constantly needs to be cycled through the different spheres on Earth so that it can eventually end up in the biosphere, get put into a plant, transferred to an animal, and continue getting cycled through the living things on Earth. Finally, you might not have thought of this before, but we depend on gravity. Gravity is crucial to hold the atmosphere around us so that we have something to breathe. And gravity also helps cycle chemicals through the biosphere. Think about the water cycle and how water flows downhill due to gravity. Okay, so let's think about how the earth is organized. Ecologists like to talk about five levels of organization of life, starting with an organism. An organism is you, an organism is one living being like an elephant. One level up from an organism is a population. This is a group of individuals of the same species, so a group of organisms that are all living in a, the same space. So think about not just one elephant, but a herd of elephants would be our population. And it's just that one herd that lives in that one particular area that counts as our population. A community, the next level up, is what you get when you take a bunch of populations that are in the same area and you put them together. So the community is in our, whoops, in our one little area, the herd of elephants plus all the acacia trees, plus all of the giraffes, plus all of the kudu, plus all of the hyenas. All of those living things in that same area of savanna, that is our community. 
An ecosystem is our community plus all of the non-living things that are also in the environment around them. So we have our water that's there, the sunlight that's coming in, the chemical nutrients that are in the soil, all the non-living parts of the environment around them, plus all of the living things that are interacting in that little area, that's our ecosystem. And just as a quick reminder, we have a, a term to refer to the living or non-living components of an ecosystem. The living components are called biotic components, and the non-living components are our abiotic components. Finally, we have our biosphere, and this is all of our ecosystems put together. All of the parts of Earth's air, water, and soil where life is found, that's our biosphere. Okay, so this is our composition of life on Earth. These are our different levels of organization of living things. Now, let's look at some of the smaller scale interactions. Who eats who? And when we're talking about who eats who, we're looking at either a food chain or a food web. And quick discussion of the difference between these two things. A food chain is one path of energy flow, starting from the bottom with our delicious plants that have just uh, harnessed some solar energy and converted it into chemical energy through photosynthesis, going to our herbivores that eat those plants and then the carnivores that eat those herbivores all the way up. So we've got a little dandelion here that was eaten by an a grasshopper, the grasshopper eaten by a mouse, mouse eaten by a snake, snake eaten by an eagle. That is our flow of food and our flow of energy. That is our food chain. But that is an oversimplification of what's going on around us. Because in an ecosystem, we always have multiple food chains existing. It's not just one thing that's eating our plants. Our grasshoppers eat our plants, but so do deer and so do rabbits and other organisms. So our food web are all of the different possible flows of energy, flows of food through the ecosystem. That includes all of the predators of this little rabbit here. It could be eaten by a fox or it could be eaten by an owl. Uh, and that includes all of the food sources of our owl. Our owl could eat a robin, it could eat a chipmunk, it could eat a rabbit um, or some other food sources. Notice in both of these situations, the direction of the arrow. Arrows always point to the eater and they show the flow of energy. That's important. Make sure you remember which direction your arrow points. The arrow points into the mouth of the eater. Okay, so let's dive into our food webs more and start at the bottom, the base of every food web and every food chain. The most important organism to set up life for success in an ecosystem are plants. And when we're talking about plants, we have a variety of terms to refer to them by. We can call them producers or we can call them autotrophs. And these two terms mean the same thing. Producers, autotrophs, plants, these are organisms that capture energy from sunlight and use it to synthesize food in photosynthesis. So producers, because they produce their own food, autotrophs, auto means uh self troph means food so they produce their food by themselves through photosynthesis where they're taking remember carbon dioxide and water and they're converting it into glucose and that glucose is crucial because that glucose is actually storing chemical energy um, that was energy that originated in the sun and our plants, our producers, come in a variety of, of forms. If we're looking on land, what we're really looking at for our producers are green rooted plants, our ferns, our rooted trees, our grasses, our shrubs, etc. In freshwater and shallow ocean ecosystems, we also have rooted plants. These are water hyacinth plants rooted in this freshwater lake. This is a kelp forest. This is a long rooted plant that's rooted in the ocean floor. So it's living in salt water and it lives at a depth where it can still experience sunlight. So it's still doing photosynthesis. Uh, it's not too deep for that. 
We also have things like algae that float on the surface of the water and are not rooted. And these algae are also the main component of our open ocean ecosystem. In our open ocean ecosystem, the base of the food web is almost entirely phytoplankton. These are single-celled photosynthetic organisms. They're tiny algae, and they provide um, the entire base of the food web for our ocean ecosystem, with one exception. The one exception to all of this is organisms that don't need any light at all to make their glucose uh, because they live so deep in the ocean that there is no light present. There are organisms, specifically bacteria, that live at the bottom of the ocean floor around hydrothermal vents. These are cracks in the Earth's crust where superheated water billows out as smoke and steam. Um, and the bacteria living around these vents are producers, they are autotrophs, but they're not during, doing photosynthesis. They do something called chemosynthesis, where they still use carbon dioxide and water to make glucose, but they're not using energy from sunlight to do it. They're actually using energy stolen from molecules coming out of these hydrothermal vents, especially hydrogen sulfide. And so what's really cool about this is that it can form the base of a totally unique food web. And we still have producers at the base and we still have uh, animals like these giant tube worms that eat those producers, but there's no plants involved. There's no sunlight involved. So it's pretty cool. All right, let's move on to the animal side of things. What about organisms that don't make their own food, that don't make glucose? Those are called consumers. And consumers are also called heterotrophs. Uh, that means that they have to eat other organisms to get their chemical energy. And what's tricky is that some of them have mouths like animals, but not all of them do. Fungi, mushrooms, uh, are also consumers. They don't do photosynthesis. They have to consume their food for energy, but they don't have a mouth to help them do it. So we group our consumers based on what they eat. Our primary consumers are also known as herbivores, and they eat plants or primary producers. Secondary consumers are defined as organisms that eat primary consumers. And so if they're just eating primary consumers, if they're just eating those animals, uh, they would be carnivores. But our secondary consumers can have a varied diet, and maybe some of them eat herbivores, but they also eat plants. In that case, they would be considered omnivores. Tertiary consumers eat secondary consumers. Quaternary consumers eat tertiary consumers. So Quaternary, tertiary, and secondary consumers could be either carnivores if they're only eating animals or omnivores if they're eating a range of animals and plants. But what defines this first word in front of the consumer is the next level down that it eats. Secondary consumers eat primary consumers, tertiary eat secondary, quaternary eat tertiary. So this is a very nicely organized and beautiful flow of energy, flow of food. Um, but we have organisms in the food web that make things a lot messier. And they're the category of organisms that eat dead stuff. And we split them into two groups. We have our decomposers. And these are very small organisms like bacteria, like fungi, like some insects, millipedes, earthworms that eat dead organisms and return their nutrients to the soil, water, or air. So think about an earthworm chowing through soil, and you know what an earthworm does. It poops out soil on the other end, and that soil that it poops out is full of nutrients. Same deal with these fungi eating a dead tree. They're eating a dead tree, and they're going to help return that tree into soil. So decomposers, uh, we think of as breaking down dead stuff, breaking down the dead plants and animals that they're eating through. Detritivores or scavengers also eat dead organisms, but we don't usually think about them as breaking down and returning nutrients to the soil, water, or air. We think about them as just eating dead plants or animals for food. So these are our large animals like hyenas, like vultures, some insects like dung beetles could be considered detritivores. They also eat dead organisms, but they're not immediately returning their nutrients to the environment around them. 
decomposers and detritivores are both critical components uh, in the chemical cycling part of sustainability. Some of them immediately return nutrients to the soil, but overall they, they help to continually um, push molecules and nutrients through the environment. Okay, so let's look more at a food chain and think about the energy that flows through a food chain. Remember I said that these arrows show not just the direction the food is moving, but the direction the energy is moving. And what's usually not included in a food chain or food web is the initial source of that energy. But here it is, it's solar energy. And so let's think about how this works. Solar energy comes in through the atmosphere and a lot of it just hits the ground and bounces off and is radiated off as heat. Some of it gets trapped by producers, by plants, and it gets trapped by those plants in the bonds of the glucose molecules they make during photosynthesis. Then those plants and all living things have to immediately break down a lot of that glucose for energy to fuel their chemical reactions and keep the plants alive. When that happens, a lot of that energy that was stored in the glucose gets converted to other forms of chemical energy or gets lost as heat. But a little bit of that energy stays in the plants, still in the form of glucose and other carbohydrates. And that energy is what gets eaten and transferred to our second trophic level, our primary consumers. And so they get a little bit of that energy that they eat from plants. Same deal, they break down a lot of those molecules uh, and use the energy stored in them for life. And they lose a lot of that energy as heat. So only a little bit of energy leaves, stays stored in their bodies available to be transferred to the next trophic level, the secondary consumers. So what I want you to notice here is all of the energy loss. And shout out to the second law of thermodynamics for reminding us that energy is constantly being transferred into a less useful form. And that's really what we're seeing here. All of these points where you see heat being uh, lost from the energy flow, those are points where our energy is being converted into a less useful form and being lost from the food web. Okay, so one more time, the second law of thermodynamics reminds us that all energy transfer between trophic levels will be inefficient. And now we can talk about how inefficient. Uh, about 90% of energy is lost in each transfer. And we typically phrase this the other way. We call this the 10% rule. 10% of usable chemical energy is transferred to each higher trophic level. And that's just a rule of thumb. That's not exact, but it tends to line up pretty well to what we see in nature. So here's what that means. Our, in our, this is a ocean and terrestrial food web where we start with phytoplankton, our producers, they get eaten by zooplankton, which get eaten by perch, those are fish, and those perch get eaten by humans. So our producers, our phytoplankton, managed to create 10,000 calories worth of energy through photosynthesis, and they have that stored in their body. When zooplankton eat all of those phytoplankton that together add up to 10,000 calories worth of food, the zooplankton are only able to store 10% of that in their bodies. So the zooplankton altogether only consist of a thousand calories. And that's because they lost the other uh, 9,000 to the environment, mostly as heat. When those zooplankton are eaten by perch, the fish, the perch are only able to store 100 calories worth of that 1,000 calories in their bodies, which means that when the humans finally eat the perch, they're only eating 100 calories worth of fish. And what's stored in our bodies, only about 10 calories are added permanently to our bodies. So what it, you should notice here is how uh, quickly the amount of energy available decreases as we go up the food chain. This explains why food chains rarely have more than four or five trophic levels. The energy is just not there to support more than that. Okay, uh, going in a slightly different direction, we gotta talk about the relationships that species have in ecosystems, starting with the role that a species plays in its environment. This is called its niche or niche, and you can go with whatever pronunciation you want, niche or niche, they're both right. 
A niche is the pattern of living that an organism has. So this includes everything about their life history, where they live, their habitat preference, what time of day they're awake. Are they awake during the day, diurnal? Are they awake during the night? Are they nocturnal? What do they eat? Are they an omnivore? Are they really focused on only one type of plant? What's their hunting behavior? Do they hibernate? Do, do they hibernate? And what environmental conditions can they tolerate? Can they live in salty water, only fresh water, uh, brackish water, which is somewhere in between? Could they migrate between all three? What is their tolerance? So we divide organisms up into two groups based on how wide or narrow their niche is. A generalist is a species with a really broad niche. And this is in particular in relation to their food preference and their environmental tolerance. Raccoons are a great example of a generalist because they are omnivores, just like us. They eat plants, they eat animals. Um, they are also scavengers, they will, they will eat dead stuff. So they have a huge uh, food preference range and they also have a pretty wide environmental tolerance. They have a ton of different habitats that they can successfully live in. Humans are also generalists. We have very broad niches. Cockroaches, the classic survivor, generalists. White-tailed deer, flies, they've got broad food preferences. They can survive in a wide variety of conditions. They are all generalists. Specialists are species with narrow niches, especially in relation to food preference and environmental tolerance. The giant panda is a great example of this. The giant panda has a very narrow food preference. They will only eat certain species of bamboo. And because of this, they are also hedged into a really small habitat range. They will only live where those species of bamboo are present. And right now, the giant panda has been boxed into the ever decreasing bamboo forests of China. That is the only place that has the environmental conditions and the food availability that they need to survive in the wild. So, what you want to be thinking about is who can survive environmental change? Is it a generalist or a specialist? It's definitely a generalist because generalists can tolerate wide ranges of conditions. They can eat a variety of food sources. When the environment starts changing due to, for example, human interference or human mediated climate change, generalists will be able to adapt to a variety of conditions specialists will not. So who's in danger of going extinct first? Definitely specialists. So what's the pro of being a specialist? Why do we see species that are specialists if it makes them less tolerant to environmental changes? Well, niche specialization, having a really spe specialized niche, can help reduce competition in an environment. Let me show you an example. All of these different species of birds coexist in the same very narrow region of shoreline. And they can do that without competing against each other because they're all so specialized that they're not in competition at all. They all have their own unique environment and they are the specialist of that environment. Our oyster catcher gets its food from the very edge of the water and it has a bill that allows it to feed on things with two shells, clams, mussels, other shellfish, and it can use its beak to pry them open. Just up the shore from that is our dowitcher, which doesn't eat those crustaceans like clams and mussels. It burrows deep into the sand and it eats things that are further down in the sand, like snails, marine worms, small crustaceans, some insects. Our sandpiper also eats things that live in the sand, but a little closer to the surface, worms and small crustaceans. And finally, our piping plover eats things that are further up on the beach that live on the very, very surface of the sand, like insects and tiny crustaceans. So what's incredible about this ecosystem is how diverse it is in such a small area. And it's able to maintain this biodiversity because each of these organisms is not in competition with each other. They have a specialized niche. niche. So pros of niche specialization, it allows for huge amounts of biodiversity. Cons of niche specialization are that that biodiversity 
is probably fairly intolerant to change. There's going to be major issues if that ecosystem experiences environmental change. Okay, what other roles do species serve in an environment? Well, there's a type of species we like to call an indicator species. These are species that are super, super sensitive to everything that's going on around them. Birds, butterflies, amphibians, really sensitive species that are also present in ecosystems worldwide. I like to think about um, amphibians because their skin is very similar, it's wet, it's very similar to the skin of our eyes, our nose, our mouths, those mucous membranes. And the sensitive skin of amphibians allows them to be early warners of environmental harm. If a toxin is introduced into the environment at very low levels, we're probably not gonna realize it's there, but it's gonna start having an effect and it'll have an effect on amphibians first. And so ecologists frequently monitor these in indicator species populations because if they see something happening in those indicator species populations, that's a clue that they need to look for something else going on in the environment, potentially a chemical spill, some toxin has been introduced, um, and they will want to be able to identify that issue and resolve it before it impacts additional species. Indicator species, super sensitive, they'll be impacted first, and they allow us to see early warning signs of environmental harm. On totally different track, we also have keystone species. These are secondary, tertiary, or quaternary consumers whose roles have a large effect on the types and abundance of other species in an ecosystem. Sea otters are a great example of this. Take a look at this very simple food chain. Sea otters eat sea urchins, which eat kelp. So that makes sea otters a secondary consumer in this ecosystem. And when the sea otters are present, they keep the sea urchin population in check by eating them. And that means that the kelp is able to thrive because it doesn't have a lot of predators. That is a big deal because the physical kelp itself provides a habitat for a ton of other aquatic organisms that use the kelp forest for shelter, for breeding grounds, and also for food. When the sea otters are removed, potentially because they are overhunted for their pelts, for their fur, um, there's a cascading chain of events that happens. First, the sea urchin population explodes because they have no predators. With all of those sea urchins, the kelp forest disappears because the sea urchins eat it all. When that kelp forest disappears, it takes more than just the kelp with it. It takes away the home of all of those other organisms that were living in the kelp forest. And so when we remove the sea otter, the biodiversity of this ecosystem collapses. Other classic examples of keystone species, wolves, like the wolves that we see in Yellowstone National Park, and starfish, carnivorous starfish in the intertidal zone on rocky shorelines. Okay, some other types of important species are foundation species. These are sometimes called ecological engineers. They physically modify the environment in ways that benefit other species. Beavers are a great example of this. When beavers uh, gnaw down trees and tree limbs and use them to construct dams across rivers, they physically modify the environment. They're building a dam and that dam provides a home for themselves, but it also provides a habitat for a bunch of other species. Many birds build their nests in dams because land-based predators can't get to them out there. Um, a lot of migratory fish species like trout and salmon use beaver dams as safe refuge during the winter. They uh, hide out in beaver dams to survive a cold winter. So beavers provide a physical environment. They actually create habitats around them and they provide those habitats for other species. Elephants do similar things when they knock down trees and bring the leaves of the trees closer to the ground so that other grazing animals can access them and eat them. And then finally, we have bad species, uh, non-native species or invasive species. So native species are species that are native to a particular region without any human intervention. 
Non-native species are species that have been intentionally or accidentally introduced to a region that is outside of their native range. And sometimes they're introduced into this region and there's a predator there, they get all eaten up and they're gone. Sometimes they're introduced into a new area and they're not tolerant to the conditions of the new area, they die out. And sometimes they get introduced into a new area and the conditions are just right for them to live and there are no predators. And so their population grows out of control. And now they are a invasive species. For example, we have kudzu here on the left, which is a vine native to Japan that was intentionally introduced into the United States. And unfortunately, it's really good at growing on the east coast of the United States, and there are no native predators. And so in a normal day, it can grow one to two feet, and it will grow over everything in its path. It'll grow over trees, lampposts, houses. You can see it growing over a bunch of trees and bushes here. And when it grows over them, it actually smothers them by preventing the plants underneath from accessing sunlight. So it causes a lot of environmental harm. These are spiny lionfish that are native to the Pacific Ocean around um, Indonesia and India. And they have been accidentally introduced into the um, east coast of North, Central, and South America in the tropical waters around there. And they survive really well over there. And they don't have any predators over in the Atlantic, but they themselves are a predator. They eat smaller fish. And so slowly but steadily, they have decimated the tropical fish populations found in the Atlantic Ocean along the tropical waters in North, Central, and South America. Okay, one other type of relationship we should talk about are relationships between species. Mutualistic relationships where two species interact and both benefit. For example, a hummingbird and a flower where the hummingbird gets food, the nectar from the flower, and the flower gets pollinated, get fer gets fertilized as the hummingbird transfers pollen from another flower into this one. They both benefit. The oxpecker bird and the rhino have a mutualistic relationship. The oxpecker eats insects off of the rhino and the rhino um, doesn't get eaten by insects or parasites. The oxpecker removes those from its skin. We've also got parasitic relationships where one species benefits and the other suffers. For example, the relationship between this lake trout and the horrifying lamprey that's suctioned onto it. This lamprey is suctioned on uh, to the side of the lake trout. It's actually burrowing in through the skin of the lake trout and sucking out the blood and nutrients that are flowing through the lake trout. So when the lake trout eats, some of that food stays in the body of the lake trout and some of it goes into the lamprey. So the lamprey is benefiting here. The lake trout is definitely suffering. Uh, it's going to lose nutrients over time and it may die as a result of that relationship. And finally, we have commensalistic relationships where one species benefits and the other isn't affected. For example, the relationship between this air plant and the tree that it's growing on. This air plant is growing on a little nook um, in the tree. It's not taking any nutrients from the tree at all, but it's able to grow higher up in the canopy by growing on the tree. And it actually takes all of its nutrients from the air around it. So this epiphyte, this air plant benefits and the tree that it's growing on doesn't feel an effect. And that is commensalism. Okay, so those are our relationships between species that we need to talk about. Our last section is about the physical environments that species live in, biomes. And I'm gonna go through these really quickly. What I want you to do is read along in section 7.2 in your textbook. That's where you're gonna find the best details about biomes. And remember, if you don't have a textbook yet, don't stress, it's posted on the course materials page on your Canvas course. Okay, first category of biomes we should look at, deserts. These are our driest biomes. And we separate deserts into three different types of biomes. Our very hot tropical deserts, our slightly cooler temperate deserts, and our coldest 
cold deserts. So deserts, all three of these are categorized by very, very low precipitation, extremely low precipitation. And because you can see these all have different temperature ranges, they have variable temperatures. Our tropical deserts stay fairly hot year round. Our temperate deserts, so tropical deserts, that's what we see in places like the Sahara Desert in Northern Africa, right near the equator. Temperate deserts we see in the southwestern United States, and you might know that these are deserts that are very hot during the summer, but can get pretty cold down to freezing during the winter. And then we have cold deserts, like this uh, picture of the Gobi Desert in that takes up a lot of Western China. Um, and cold deserts can get really cold. They spend the winter below zero. The summers get warm, but not as hot as a tropical or temperate desert. And again, what characterizes all of these is how low the precipitation is. Because of that low precipitation, these ecosystems are super fragile. Plant growth is really slow due to the lack of water. Nutrient cycling and decomposition also really slow due to the lack of water. And so all together, that leads to really low species diversity. The primary plant life that we see in our deserts are plant species that are adapted to that low moisture. We see cacti, we see succulents, we see very, very drought resistant shrubs. And then in some very unusual places in our tropical deserts uh, called oases, where there is a, a little bit of surface water, picture a beautiful tropical oasis in the middle of a desert, you know what lives there because of how hot the tropical deserts are and because of the water that's available in an oasis, we can see huge plant life there like palm trees and other large shrubs. Um, but that is not characteristic of most of the tropical desert. That only happens when we have a little bit of surface water in an oasis. Most of our tropical desert is devoid of plant life or features very, very small, extremely drought tolerant species. Our next category of biome are the grasslands. And again, we separate them into three varieties. Our warmest tropical grasslands that we call savanna. Think about the savanna in Southern Africa. Our temperate grasslands, a little cooler, that we also call prairie. Think about the Great Plains of the United States or the steppes in Russia. And then finally, we have our coldest grasslands that are called the Arctic tundra. So you might have thought of the tundra as just snow and ice, but it's actually a grassland underneath all of that snow and ice. Grasslands are defined also by their precipitation. They have a little more precipitation than a desert, but not enough to be a forest. Trees are very water intensive species. They need a lot of rainfall and there's just not enough rainfall in a grassland to support trees. So we see mostly grasses. Um, our primary plant life is our drought tolerant grasses. It gets fairly low in precipitation at certain points in the year. And so these grasses typically have adaptations like deep roots to help them tap into groundwater. Our next category of biome is our forest. And forests, they have trees. Immediately, you should be thinking rainfall. Remember, trees are really water intensive. They can only survive where there's a lot of rain. And so our forests are characterized by heavy rainfall. Um, our hottest forests, our tropical rainforests, are found around the equator, experience a lot of rainfall and warm temperatures year round. These trees never drop their leaves. They stay green year round. Our temperate deciduous forests, this is what we have around us, um, variety of temperatures throughout the year. These forests are characterized by deciduous trees that drop their leaves in the fall and winter and regrow them in the spring and summer. And those leaves are thin, they're flexible, they grow quickly, they grow wide, they allow the plants to grow significantly during the summer, but the, the trees go into essentially dormancy or hibernation during the winter when they drop those leaves. Our northern forests, sometimes called our northern coniferous forest, or our boreal forest, or taiga, they're made of coniferous trees, conifer trees. Those are evergreen trees that don't have thin, flexible leaves like deciduous trees. They've got needles as their leaves, and that's so that they don't have to drop their needles during the winter, and they can survive um, even in cold temperatures with maybe little precipitation. Um, those needles stay on the, the trees year round and they can serve water throughout the winter.
So the physical structure of the trees, all of the heights of the trees, provides a ton of different habitats. So there's a lot of niches in forests, and this leads to the really high biodiversity that we see in forests around the world. For example, here are the different uh, niches or habitats occupied by different species in a tropical rainforest. We have our ground layer where we see organisms like the tapir walking around on the ground. Above that is our shrub layer, our understory, our shorter trees where we see things like the woolly opossum living, our canopy or taller layer of treetops where we see birds like the toucan, and then finally our emergent layer of trees, the very, very tallest tips of trees where our predator bird species like harpy eagles might live. Remember, all of these different spaces create different habitat zones, different niches, a lot of biodiversity. Our final biome is our mountain biome. And this is also a very variable biome because the whole point of a mountain is that our climate will change based on our altitude. So we go further up the mountain, it gets colder, and it'll also get a little drier. So we've got a variety of environments, maybe our deciduous forest down at the base, our, conif our coniferous forest with our needle leaves a little higher up where it gets a little colder. Above that, it might get too dry for trees to live. So we transition to shrubland, grassland. Eventually, even those grasses can't survive. We just have mosses and lichens. And then we might have barren rocks as it gets too tall and too cold. So same deal as the forest. We have a variety of environments. This leads to a variety of niches and high biodiversity. And that is the end of my presentation for you all about ecology, biomes, species relationships. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you've taken detailed notes and feel free to re-watch anything that you missed. Thanks for watching.